Great. Uh, welcome back to uh, our class. We are, um, I'm Sean Watts, and here are my contacts. We're part of a teaching team, uh, not just one, but there's uh, um, several people that can talk to you uh, about our cross-cultural communications class details. In week three, uh, we were talking about contrasting cultural values. There's a lot of values that you should be aware of. They're not always good or bad. They're just different. You should respect the fact that you have your values, other people have different values, and just um, expect that you don't fully understand them and realize that you have to invest time and energy to fully appreciate these differing values and differing ways of communication. We went through, there is a, I think we, we showed this in class, an interesting video showing how people see cultures uh, as different. We defined culture as being complex. Um, there's uh, different levels of understanding. Make sure you're aware of those. The, the differences in uh, the definition of culture, but one of the simplest and best definitions that I know of is this culture is created by a collection of shared values and shared attitudes and shared behaviors, uh, all of which will make the culture. So culture makes the values, the values make attitudes, attitudes make behavior. That, uh, that goes around and it's with any group of people. Um, so we talked about those, we saw what were the values, we talked about what is very, very important. People are born being parochial, which means people only know one way of things, but then after they get educated, they learn there's another way, but they usually don't fully appreciate them, and so they think their way is better than the other alternative way that's ethnocentric, just like Adolf Hitler, just like very, very bad people. And so we ultimately realize there is SRC, our self-reference or self-reliance, uh, self-reference criterion or self-reliance criteria. Those uh, details in your mind, in your heart that make you believe some things are good and some things are bad, that alone is bad because it's only you. So you must invest time and energy to try to understand the other people in order to properly communicate with them. Otherwise, you're going to be doing that Trump style of communication. So we went through what culture is not. We talked about several different examples of uh, contrasting values. We identified that there's different dimensions of culture. Hofstede uh, has the power distance, collectivism, uh, masculinity, femininity, uncertainty, avoidance. Uh, we showed this information about how Korea relates to other countries. And I wasn't saying good things or bad things. I was just relaying the facts about Korea um, can specifically identify, for example, people in our class in Korea, they don't typically feel confident talking with a new group or in class. Uh, does that seem right to you? Let's see. Uh, uh, Kim, so Min, do you agree that talking in class is a little bit strange and awkward for you if you are a traditional Korean student? I think it depends. On what, the time of day? How drunk you are? Can you be more specific? Right so, now I mean, you're communicating versus Edward Hall, you're using one or two words. Can you use a few more? Uh, if I think it differs based on the characteristic of that person or student. If they are like active, then they will talk. But most students, I think, are shy and not used to used to in the atmosphere of like um, talking to other people and changing ideas. Right. Good. On average, if we take the Korean society as one group and describe that regular average Korean person, uh, would you agree that most Koreans don't usually feel comfortable uh, talking or asking questions or answering questions in class? 
not most but usually yeah not most people but that's the most popular answer okay um i have one other idea sorry who else was was talking go ahead it's me Kyungo, uh about koreans okay i think it depends on how uh when when the class starts or when the class is uh being held in korean a lot of koreans used to talk but when it comes to english they're a little bit shy of maybe they are making error or because they're making uh when they are speaking grammatically errors uh they're afraid of it but um, when it comes to uh korean i think even regularly uh normal koreans they they love to talk um during okay. like english classes and korean classes i'm having both so i can feel that okay um, so, although Hofsted is famous and Hofsted has promoted this um, way of identifying cultures have different dimensions, you need to understand cultures, you need to understand the different dimensions of different people. Hofsted is, is restricting his views to uh, countries. And even though he does those, there could be, the, there could be mistakes. So, what are some other possible ways? to um, understand culture. Hofsted describes culture in one way. Any other um, research theories that you guys are aware of? Hopefully you guys are also aware of Edward Hall and Trompenar and uh, Kluckhorn and Stradbeck and Schwartz and the Globe Project. There are several different um, people that have identified there are different dimensions of culture that you must understand so whoever it is you're trying to communicate with you must communicate with them understanding their values so uh, as long as you you do that and you understand them that's good um Hosted, he could have some mistakes but in general he is uh, very widely known to describe korean culture this way there are many ways to do it um there are different hours in the day some people um focus culture like you may be a night owl versus a, a morning person other people may like to work many different hours versus a, a few hours or the average working week so there's a variety of different things and cultural attitudes towards work attitudes toward ethics uh, social ethics uh, related to um the uh, surrounding yourself with other people, the idea of uh, how you connect with other people. Uh, this was all discussed in uh, previous classes, but I understand this week there may be a group that wants to uh, present. Um, if that group is here, you should let us know so we can set up you guys for being able to be smart, present your information, get marks, share with the class, so you can teach the rest of the class some of these details um, as we go forward. Is that clear? Hua and Duong, uh, there is another group of students that might want to present today, right? Are you guys ready? Uh, yes, they, they are Ola Beck and uh, Ali, I guess. So... Okay. Uh, professor, can we present after 10 minutes? Sure. Um, Thank you. As we go through this, make sure everybody is aware of the idea of uh, differing cultures and culture contrast. There's no better way to understand other cultures than to start with yourself. So understand your own culture. Again, we've gone through this mind map. This identifies your culture and what careers may match you. Uh, if you want to have a more advanced version, humanmetrics.com or 16personalities.com is more professional using the Carl Jung um, MBTI uh, programs to identify your cultures and your personalities. Uh, we've talked about a, a variety of things. We've had videos talking about how you manage some of these things. There's um, social clusters you must understand. There's societal clusters. Um, that you must understand. There, there's a uh, team orientation um, that it's very important. For example, in um, 
some cultures um, are focused more on groups than others. Other people want to have one person being a leader versus other people are focused on the whole groups going forward. Um, participating from higher to lower. Uh, we have German um, versus Nordic versus Anglo, and it changes all the way down to the, the Middle East, which might be a different type of participation from higher to lower. Um, humane orientations, uh, autonomous clusters from higher to lower, uh, self-protective, higher to lower, um, and then even words, semantics. There, there's a variety of things that we have been talking about with these. Um, all of this information has been available uh, online in our PPTs. Before we get into all of these uh, things reviews, uh, I just wanted to make sure that you guys have gone through this understood there are different contrasting cultural values some cultures are different than yours but it's not it's not good it's not bad they're just different uh even if you have a completely different uh culture than somebody beside you try to understand what it is before you start communicating and saying something that you may regret if you don't understand it um with that in mind this week we have uh, missed some classes we will have a makeup class uh, we will be uh, having that makeup class next week i believe there's already been some communications with everybody and we've decided on some details uh, be aware of it you don't have to attend but we will be expanding upon this stuff the whole idea of culture shock uh, some people see others and may be shocked um, just with simple things like the thai long neck woman but um, there's lots more to it. What's the bigger, biggest culture shock you guys have ever experienced? Any ideas? Anybody want to volunteer things? I can yeah, volunteer. I have one, actually. Sure. Go ahead. Um, so <laughs> when I came to Korea and I was in the subway and I had to go to the bathroom and I go in there and like all the stalls were squat toilets. And that was really <laughs> shocking for me. <laughs> You don't like squatting over top of your pants, <laughs> for example. Yes, I absolutely understand that. Had the same shock when I first arrived. Yes. Um, other than <laughs> pooping, <laughs> any other uh, cultural um, incidents or activities that may have shocked you? Um, can I can I say my own experience? Yes, well, it's not can. it's not an experience, but like what is like culture shock is like mostly in America, people getting into their bed with their shoes on is a is like a lot of culture shock for me. And, and what was really shocking that when I knew like when I found out that people get their driver's license at the age of 15, I was like, they're basically a child for like for my eyes and for for my point of view so i was like really shocked when i found out these two things about uh, mostly america okay um that's a great example and as we see on the uh, screen that i'm showing in the top right corner you have that uh, shocked face another shocked face blowing your mind make sure you appreciate the more shocked you are the more you have to invest your time and energy to understand it before you say it's bad. Because if you do say anything that shocks you is bad, that's the same thing as, as relating to Adolf Hitler. If you don't understand it, think it's bad, kill it, you're bad. You, you must try to understand other people. Um, I, I think everybody understands um, Chinese is a different culture than Canadians. Um, um, Mukalisa, you just joined the group. You understand that China is a different culture than where you're from, but you can't say it's bad because there's 1.4 billion people doing it. Same thing in India. Uh, we're, we're not all Indians, but when you have 1.3 billion people doing things a certain way, there must be a reason um for it so don't say these other things whatever it is that is shocking you 
protect yourself so that you don't say it's bad. Protect yourself so that you don't say um, it's, it's strange or stupid. Um, make sure you invest your, your time and energy to understand it. Uh, great, thanks. Any other, uh, can I get a few other examples of shocking cultural experiences? Uh, yes, I have, I have one. Um, when uh, we arrived uh, in Korea, uh, but I, 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 knew, uh, I, knew, I knew it before, but um, some people in Korea and uh, Asia, like Chinese people, uh, they, they um, uh, in their culture, it's normal to eat uh, dog, dog meat. Um, so as a European, uh, it, it shocks me, but maybe it's good, you know, but that's a bit weird to say that you're going to eat um, pets for us. Uh, it's, yeah. Hey, that's a great example. Yes. Um, anybody wants to try to invest time to explain it? I'm not saying it's good or bad yet, but can anybody explain what may have created the culture? And I'm not just talking about Korea. Uh, Korea used to eat a lot of dogs. Uh, China did the same with several different animals. Many countries have done that. So before we say it's bad, can anybody explain where that culture may have started from? You see a picture of this is me and my family and we're eating meat. It's uh, hopefully not dog, but I could explain to you a situation that may help you understand if it was dog. So anybody want to try to guess and explain that? Rosie, would you like to guess? Somebody was just about to, to talk. Who was that? Yeah, it, it was me. Uh, so uh, I, I think that maybe uh, some, somewhere in the history of Asia, there was a big, huge uh, crisis on food, maybe. And then just like uh, soldiers uh, during tough wars uh, had to eat their horses, uh, maybe they had to eat their pets. I don't know. That's Good. the case. Okay, so if that type of environment happened around you, you could understand it was either die or you, you could eat your pet. But if we go beyond that, how could you think of that system even deeper? What if your country was raped and pillaged and you had no trees, you had no animals, no everything was basically removed from your country? What is one of the fastest, easiest ways to start growing a food source, a meat food source? Generally, dogs are smaller, easier to transport, easier to, to import from other countries than cows, for example, and they're easier to manage and, and grow um, easier than, than cows. So when there was a huge national poverty issue, when people were literally starving and they didn't have shoes or they didn't actually have one bowl of rice, the average family in Korea in the 1960s didn't have one full bowl of rice each day for a family. So in that type of environment, being able to raise several small canine animals as farm animals was one of the most affordable, efficient ways to grow a meat source. So in that sense, it was just a canine meat source. Um, does that better explain that whole idea of dog meat? Uh, professor? Yes. Uh, I believe because in Korea, maybe at the time we don't have enough uh, animal welfare ideas. So I think we don't think eating dog is not a problem because uh, like eating cow meat is 
just just same like eating dog because uh, dog is not really a pet in Korea at the time, but uh, protecting protecting house is bigger their role. So yeah, I believe the welfare of animal is the key ideas, I believe. Like, uh, for example, in the future, the welfare of cow, welfare of pig are become uh, crucial. And I think so at sometimes we will uh, ban to eat pig and, or fish when their, their welfare become more issued. Yes, so I think eating dog and eating cow is feels same at the time. Yeah, that's my idea. Okay, that I um, that idea is actually an advanced idea. It wasn't the actual initial idea. So when the country was actually starving, long before they they were thinking about. Uh, social welfare and animal welfare or environmental welfare long before that when they were just thinking about starving to death being alive or dead they were just thinking about getting sources of food meat and protein they were growing vegetables they were trying to get meat canines or dogs were one of the easiest to manage so it was just a food source period and many years later once they started to become wealthier, started to develop, then we got into the argument that you were talking about, the animal welfare, the environmental welfare. And the more we develop, the more things change. But yes, uh, the overall idea is make sure you're aware that culture shock could have some explanations to it. You also should understand that although Korea uh, used to eat dogs, it is now illegal. And Korea is an advanced rich country now, but it's also super famous for one of the fastest growing countries in the world, raising people in the 1960s and 70s, less than $100 per year up to, you know, one of the richest countries in the world, just in the 1960s and 70s. So it took 20 or 30 years for the country to grow from starving with nothing to being fully developed. So that... You know, I was alive during then. So it's it's recent for my timeline. And so uh, although it's not popular today, it was popular 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, great. What's another example of cultural differences or cultural shocks? What about family? How could family be a shock? I'm showing a picture of my family. This is just the Korean family. And I have hundreds of Canadian relatives in addition to this, this Korean family. How could family be a shock? More specifically, this little lady at the bottom in the, the brown or with the hat on at the table, she is my mother-in-law. An amazing woman, always looks like a fashion model, even though she's like 500 years old. But she used to shock me and drive me crazy by being nice. How could that happen? Can anybody guess? How could being nice and taking care of your family be considered a cultural shock? And if you're ignorant, it's considered really bad. Anybody want to guess about that? I'm identifying a culture shock with my family. This is my wife. These are my kids. The lady in the top table at the back with the hat, that's my Korean mother-in-law. Or this lady in the brown here on the, the far side, that's my, my mother-in-law. Wonderful lady. But when we first met, I used to have culture shock from her being too kind to me. What do I mean by that? How could that be understood? Um, Jules, would you like to guess? Uh, yeah. Um, so maybe, um, in, I don't know uh, how it is in Canada, but maybe uh, in Canada, there is um, like, the, your mother-in-law has to be uh, mean or a bit um, 
looking looking after you to see if you uh, don't hurt uh, her daughter or her, you, you know. Uh, but I think this uh, re reasoning uh, is maybe outdated. Um, in my case, what I know from what I know from friends, uh, if your mother-in-law is mean with you, uh, just that she's not a good person. It's not because she's uh, your mother-in-law that she uh, she's um, uh, not uh, uh, not going easy with you. Uh, you know. But, but 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 do you understand my statement? I'm not saying she's yeah. bad. I'm not saying she's mean. I'm saying she's too nice. She's too good. And that's bad or a shock in my initial ignorant understanding. When I first came to Korea, when I started getting into the family, this lady, this mother-in-law was too good. She was too nice. And I didn't understand that. I was uncomfortable. I was in culture shock because of that. My mother in Canada is also nice, but not the same way. Uh, do you understand that? Anybody want to guess what we're talking about? Chung Don Jung, do you want to guess what, what I'm talking about? Uh, sorry, um, professor. I was lost. Okay, we had some lady that I think wanted oh, to. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes? I just tried to guess, like, is it like tear the kimchi with her hand and give you? Exactly. Yes. She really? Would chop, she would chop up my food and put it into my mouth. Like she would make it in her hands and come over and feed me, putting delicious food in my mouth. But my Canadian mind was like, holy cow, whoa, 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 lady, it's food. I eat myself. My mother in Canada stopped doing that 50 years ago when I was one year old. And so I'm not comfortable somebody feeding me, let alone, you know, a mother-in-law that I know, but, you know, I'm not, you know, that close with her. She, she's trying to be nice. And she might be putting on a, a scarf around me or, or, or changing my clothes or putting a heater next to me or a fan next to me, doing all of these things to try to take care of me, showing she cares, which is respectful, but in Canada, I was like, whoa, culture shock, give me some space. So yes, th that's just one example. Of course, if you come from a different culture, maybe kimchi will be a culture shock. Maybe soju might be a culture shock. Maybe having quiet students in class might be a culture shock. But there are many things. Even the idea of how you love somebody, how you give respect for somebody, it could be a culture shock to somebody. And before you understand uh you may think it's bad you have to try to understand why are they doing it they're doing it even though it's work to them they would prefer to just sit down and relax to try to just be polite so it, it needs to be understood yes exactly uh there's many things we're going to be talking about today culture shock and the, the symptoms stages of cultural shock how to help and alleviate the cultural shock public private self uh, which I was just talking about. Um, my idea of space and private area was different than in, in Korea, what is uh, private or, or what's okay, and how to overcome cultural shock. So we'll be talking about those things. Um, there is another group of students. You're able to uh, present anytime you want to start speaking up. Feel free to do so. Otherwise, I'm just going to jump into the details. We, we can present now. Uh, okay, and so who wants to share your slides? Uh, can you allow me? Uh, Ulek Beck? Yes. You should be able to share your slides now. Anybody that is able to provide information in class is able to get more participation marks. So if you have something that you would like to stay and con contribute, especially if you have anything significant, please let us know and we will allow you to do so. Go ahead, Ulek Beck. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's group one, and 
today we want to present our presentation about understanding the influence of AI in healthcare industry. Our group members are Tulu Bekman Nol, Ali Akbar, Jasur Bek Rahman Birdiyev. Uh, our table of contents contains of importance of topic, research methodology, ref and reference. Why is healthcare industry important? The purpose of the healthcare industry is to promote health, to help, to provide treatment, and to increase the quality of life of the individuals that are being served. Each medical professional has chosen to pursue a career to help mankind in a self, selfless act and without self-interest. And the, the presence of the artificial intelligence is so crucial that it, it will be applied into any sector of the industry. And also technologies such as spatial recognition technologies, virtual reality applications, chatbots, robots, artificial intelligence in Google Maps, and language translators, app audio tours, ease of shopping, HTS will continue to develop for satisfying customer traveling experience. And our research methodology consists of the analyze and understand the information available on internet. And also we may use uh, previous research papers and case studies will help us visualize the impact of AI in healthcare industry. And also we can learn customers' attitude about using AI technology in the healthcare industry. And also we will, uh, at the end, we will uh, make our results will be driven by statistical analysis. Uh, here is our reference. And thank you for your attention. Great. Any comments for that? Before we get into too much of the group, I just wanted to remind um, Jasser and Ali and Ulibek, you shared a link to this. So you are learning about AI. Great. You gave a link to the class, which is great. You're learning to uh, work with the technology. However, one thing that we might have overlooked is the link you shared is a link only that you can use. <laughs> so uh, that, that uh, link doesn't allow me to see things and it definitely doesn't allow the teaching team to uh, edit things. So now I will share our PPT. Great, thanks. Thank um, any other comments? How about um, Kyung Gan Jung? Can you give a, an evaluation and a few comments about that presentation? Well, the presentation seems fine, great. He has uh, his information, his group's information, everything seems great. But I was thinking, uh, where is his like, where I was looking for his work, like where is the like introduction? Like, okay, I understand why the topic is important, what he is aiming for, but I was just, uh, I was expecting to see the research or the, the a little bit paper would be great for me. But PPT and I, I understand how he's going to do the research and research methodology seems great for me. Okay, so for a market of 15, how would you evaluate that? I would give a... I would, I would give a... Uh, drum roll, stress, uh, stress, stress. I don't know, I want to ask a little bit like, <laughs> how, how much do you want? I can give any, any support <laughs> you want. <laughs> I'm being very generous. Um, if I if I if I have to give, I would give like thirteen or fourteen. But if he made some paperwork, it would be like fifteen already. Great. Okay. Um, what about Rosie? Rosie Elwood, would you be able to give a few comments and an evaluation? I can't hear you, Rosie. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Sorry, I've been having issues with my laptop. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I think I thought it was overall a really good presentation, um, and a very interesting topic, and uh, very like centered, like AI technology in health healthcare. So it's quite like a specific topic that can be very useful in the future, especially with the way technology is going now. Um, I would probably say the same, 13, 14. Okay, thanks. Anybody else want to um, take a look at what we are doing? Uh, we are finishing the very first group presentations, um, big times getting marks, and um, there are some cultures that can communicate and just offer a, here's a number and just tell you a, a fact very, very quickly. Uh, I'd like to talk about that for a little while and how it compares to other cultures. For example, I believe in Korea, it's very uh, strange. Korean people may think it's strange. It's not the Korean culture to speak openly and tell somebody else, here's three ways to improve and here's a mark. I think many Korean people find that very hard to do. Can I get some comments about that? Can I help? Can I get somebody to help me identify which cultures are able to evaluate and compete and give evaluations compared to other cultures that can't? Will Win, what do you think? Which culture do you guess is able to openly say marks and an evaluation? I'm sorry, Professor, I have no idea. Okay, good, thank you. Um, and so which culture are you from? I come, I come from Vietnam. And uh, how would you tell the class the typical, the average Vietnamese person can manage this task? Giving a mark to some other person in, in the class group or saying, here are three ways you should change or consider change. Is that easy to do for you in Vietnam? Or is that also similar to Korean way, a little bit hard to do? I think to me it's, it's a little bit hard to do it. Okay. So Min Kim, I see your hand up. You're, you're going something like this for a second. I was you're, scratching my forehead, sir. I, I caught you anyway. Can you give an evaluation? Um, any idea of the countries that are easy to do that and countries that are difficult? And then the next step, we will understand one of them might be strange. The next step is why? Why would that other culture do it that way or be comfortable that way? So first of all, which cultures do you think are easy to do it? Which cultures do you think are hard? Can you, you identify mean, any? You mean when it comes to evaluate other people's work? Yes, publicly, in class, on a speaker, and YouTube to the world. Yes. Well, uh, I think as Korean, uh, I do not want to hurt other person's feeling. That's the first one. And But on the other hand, if I think about Western culture, they respect each other. Like Unless it's really horrible, they do not uh, go harsh on them. I think with some people, they they are mostly nice. Like I said, unless it's really horrible work. So I think both are same. Trying to be a nice person to the other person. I think in that sense, it's pretty much same. Eastern culture and Western culture. Okay. Um... Any other comments? I have a guess. It's um, a Um, I think um, in India, it they find it easier to evaluate the other's work compared to Uzbekistan, where we always think about not hurting other people's feelings and always we always try to give them higher marks as much as possible. 
So you're saying that your culture uh, thinks that if you say something, you might make them feel bad. And I think I heard you say the Indian culture does things differently. Yeah, I feel like they find it easier to evaluate others' work without stress. Okay, and what was the words you used to describe that when you were talking about yourself? I think I heard you say you care about other people and you don't want yeah, to hurt them. We, we care about other people's feelings a lot. Okay, um, okay, stop right there. Okay. What does that mean about Indians? Um, it's not just like <laughs> <laughs> it's not like I'm saying they're heartless. I'm trying to say that like we um kind of we are kind of afraid. I guess it's not that we are used to evaluate others' work, but when it comes to like publicly asked to evaluate someone else's work, it's like a, a lot of uh, pressure. And then we get nervous, like me, I get nervous a lot. And I try to evaluate the person's work as good as possible. That's what I'm referring to say. And I have some friends from India and like when we are communicating, like when I ask them, can they evaluate what I'm doing? They like, they don't even think for a bit, like they just like answer. So like, but when it comes to me, <laughs> I like, I think like for a long time, consider what like my words and then I say it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Especially that uh, there's so many different comments you just said that I would like to evaluate. And I think the last words you just said is that you like to evaluate the words before you say them. But what I heard from what you said was Indians don't evaluate, Indians don't care, Indians are kind of heartless. So while you think you are evaluating your words, what is SRC again? What is ethnocentrism again? Can anybody define um, the stages of awareness? We start being parochial. What does parochial mean? Muntegun, do you remember what uh, parochial or ethnocentrism is? Anybody in class? Jules, Lucas, Solomon Kim, nobody is looking excited. So we are born only knowing one way. We are born, we only see the mother, we only see the doctor, they do something to us, we start learning that is the way, and that's the only way. That's parochial. That's actually bad. But at the same time, it's natural. So it's good to, it's, it's good to understand things can be bad at the same time as it's good and natural. We are born knowing something. But because we only know that one thing and we don't know there's other ways, that's bad. It's ignorant. So you can be good and bad at the same time. You can be um, a, a great heart and caring, but at the same time, you can hurt other people at the same time. Ethnocentric is when you are trying to educate yourself about others. You have learned there are other ways. There, you know there's some other way, but you think yours is the best. That's ethnocentric. That is what Adolf Hitler says. Adolf Hitler knows there's the Jewish culture different than the German culture, so he tries to kill the Jewish culture. That's very bad. We understand it. But it's natural. It's also good and bad. It's good because you are starting to learn there's other ways. It's better than just staying parochial. Parochial, you stay in your culture, you stay in your environment, you don't know there's other ways, you only work a certain way. For example, you have a street mall selling something on the street here and you usually sell only to local people around you but then you get a tour bus coming in and you continue to sell or work and talk the same way even though those are tourists they could be from a different culture you could be insulting them like a donald trump move 
So you have to be aware of the other culture, number one. That's ethnocentric. SRC is when you know there's another way and you know that there's your way, but before you actually invest time to understand them, you say things about them, like they're heartless or they don't think about what they're saying. Please think carefully about that because, you know, 1.3 billion people doing things, there could be a reason. What could be the reason, whether it's true or not, what could be a reason why 1.3 billion people can very quickly answer a question or comment and evaluate somebody else? Any ideas? Min Jin Zheng. How would you like to guess? What can you uh, guess? Why could Indians, 1.3 billion of them, be able to evaluate other people instantly? Actually, I know a little about Indian culture. Okay, I, yes. Uh, maybe Indian is a colony of England. In, uh, in India was a colony of England, so maybe in they uh, adopt English, English, English culture, or uh, but uh, inside of India, I guess maybe France or their in their culture they debate a lot, and winning the debate is very important to them. So maybe they, or maybe they are, uh, are they more try to win in the debate, but in Asian culture, they respect others, I, I respect uh, a per superior person's idea. So maybe that's the difference. Yeah. Uh, okay, note that you were just saying, in your culture, you respect superior's idea or older people's idea. Yes. That, that sentence alone, shows any other culture that doesn't treat older people as a superior is kind of bad in some ways you, you understand that so even when you're describing yourself without very much investment into understanding the alternatives could be ethnocentric you could be insulting the other people so it's yeah. wise to always say uh, my guess is or my understanding is this can you correct it or is that correct turning it into a no. question it allows you to say almost anything without insulting people it's so I mean, it's more like hierarchy of culture hierarchy in korean culture oh okay okay good yeah. let's take a look at it from what i just heard you were talking about british culture and french culture basically giving cultural values to India. So does that mean all French people are able to uh, evaluate others quickly and, and publicly? Are there any French people in class or British people, uh, UK people in class? I'm, I'm French. OK. I yeah. guess because you're not talking very quickly, it doesn't come naturally to you or? or yes. That's that's one of the reasons. I would like to talk uh, more uh, fluent English, but it's not uh, uh, there yet. Do you think that the French system is what created Indians' ability to think and evaluate quickly? Uh, I, I don't think so. <laughs> but again, uh, just like Minjin said, uh, I have no clue about uh, Indian <laughs> history. Uh, but no, uh, I think um, maybe they, they, they were inspired by French culture, but I don't think India was a French colony. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, good. That, that, what about the whole concept? Like there's 1.3 billion people. There's so many people. You have to understand everyone's competing and it is kind of a democracy there in some sense. So in order to be noticed, you need to speak up. And in class, people usually speak up very quickly. 
very, it, it's considered natural. So in some areas, it's natural, it's good, it's required to survive, it's good to help the other people around you. If you're group oriented, you're helping the group learn to develop quickly. If you stay quiet and you allow somebody else to make a mistake, you're actually hurting them by not helping them grow. So that could be one of the reasons. So um, try to understand the, uh, the levels, parochialism, ethnocentrism, even though you start learning about things, when you describe yourself, even if you describe yourself out of respect and you describe yourself out of what you think are good terms, the words you use could insult others when you don't understand them. So it's it's some one of the ways we're going to talk in classes. How can you deal with those things? So we'll talk about that in, in class. So uh, first of all, there's strategies for. Uh, so we went through, there's many different examples of this thing. There's the topics we're going to be talking about. We went through the idea of what is cultural shock. It's the trauma that you experience when you experience a new culture. It could be uh, related to a lack of food or unacceptable standards or, or cleanliness. There's a variety of things. Uh, major symptoms could be homesickness or boredom or withdrawal, a need for excessive amounts of sleep um, or uh, compulsive eating or drinking, or you get angry or irritable, or uh, maybe you're going to exaggerate how much you clean things. There's a variety of different symptoms of culture shock. It goes through many different examples from family stress to chauvinistic excesses. Sometimes you may see in one culture, guys may have more authority or power for certain things than girls. So you may think it's better to start exaggerating that and say the opposite from your culture. You may also have hostility towards the host nationals, or you may lose your ability to work effectively with people, or you can't really explain crying or getting physically sick. There's a variety of things. What can you do with them? There's strategies. You can just give up and not accept it, or you can try to substitute it. For example, the traveler learns there are other appropriate responses or behaviors in the host culture, and you substitute those responses for the ones that are normally used in your own culture. And of course, there's the addition, the idea of strategies for coping with new culture. Um, you can do the addition or synthesis or resynthesis. Addition, what that means is the person adds the behavior of the host culture when in the presence of nationals, but they maintain your home culture behavior with others of the same culture. So you keep working the same way when you're with your culture people, but you try to add that new culture way when you're with the host culture. That's addition. Synthesis is when you integrate or combine elements of the two cultures, such as combining United States dress and the, the dress of the Philippines or resynthesis is the integration of ideas not found in either culture. A US traveler to China chooses to eat neither American food nor Chinese food, but they prefer Italian. Maybe something like that, that resynthesis. There's a variety of different ways. Stages of culture shock is the next thing. Um, do you guys understand what it means by the honeymoon phase? What does a honeymoon phase of psychology mean? when we're talking about cross-cultural communication. It's also used with travel. When you go on a vacation, or if any of you are international students and you've just arrived in Korea, you will usually go through a honeymoon stage or a honeymoon phase. What does that mean? I think it's when everything just seems like exciting and fun and everything's great. Yeah, during the honeymoon, when you start dating somebody that the beginning part of the date or the beginning of the marriage, usually it's amazing because it's just new and it's exotic. And a lot of people like the new and the exotic. And then after time goes by, you see the reality. It's not just new, it's different. And oh my God, it's a crisis. Why are they doing it this way? Why do they leave the bathroom this way or the kitchen this way or whatever it is? that during the honeymoon, you thought it was cute, 
but then it starts to be a crisis. It starts to drive you crazy. And eventually, after time, you start to have some sort of adjustments, and then you have some sort of acceptance of this different way. It's just being different. And then you have the, the re-entry into the normal phase or the normal stage of life. This uh, image of it just being a U shape has been updated with new research. The new research shows it's more of a continuation type of wave. The first wave is a very big wave. You will experience the beach and it's a honeymoon, but then you will have a typhoon or a tsunami wash over you and many other big waves that will follow. And it actually will take a, a few different times before you can actually settle in to the culture. Be aware of, of those things. Um, stage one, the excitement, fascination is the, the, the honeymoon. Stage two, the crisis or the disenchantment period where the crisis turned to disappointment. Stage three, the adjustment uh, phase, you begin to accept new culture, try new foods, see something is funny rather than just bothering you. Stage four is you accept or adapt to things. You feel at home in the new culture and become involved in activities in the culture. Uh, again, make sure that you understand that idea of becoming involved in activities is super, super important. Don't forget you have probably invested many years of your life growing up with your close friends. Your closest friends you have been involved with for, for years. And so for you to feel that same level of comfort, you have to invest that same amount of energy or time. So you have to try to get involved in these new cultural activities as quickly as you can, as much as you can, knowing they're going to drive you crazy, because after time, then you will start to get into the re-entry uh, phase. Following the stages of identifying earlier, then you'll have the euphoria, the crisis, the disenchantment, adjustment, and at the adaptation. Ultimately, you will adapt after you have experienced a lot. It's part of what we talked about with the W curve, the theory of the, the cultural shock that explains the re-entry actually takes the form of this second uh, U. So that W is what I'm talking about. This, this idea here was the very first research phase. And it's just initially you think that there's a problem and then very quickly you can get over it. Well, it, it's not that simple. In the W phase, you repeat this and eventually the wave gets smaller and smaller. So what are the problems related to re-entry? Finding a new niche in the corporate structure at home, adjusting to lower standards of living, problems reestablishing personal or professional relationships, dealing with readjustment problems with children or the difference in their educational experience abroad. So um, there's a variety of problems related to this. We, we need to start thinking about this. Um, what about repatriation? Uh, later, we're going to talk about some solutions, but when you go abroad and you experience culture shock and then you come home do you realize when you go back home you may create culture shock because you are now slightly different when you are originally from one culture that's the one culture and you go to a different culture that's a second culture and then when you have started to change and understand things you become a third culture child. So for example, me, I'm from Canada. I can go back to Canada, that's called repatriation. But when I go back, I'm no longer straight Korean. I'm not straight, blah, blah, blah. I'm not straight Canadian anymore. And I'm not fully Korean uh, either. So I am a third culture baby is what it's called. Uh, that repatriation, going back to Canada, will be a culture shock for you. Um, be aware of, of that. What about these pictures? How do you feel about these pictures? The portrait of an Arab woman, or the man from Nepal, or the Thailand long neck woman. Is anybody um, confident enough to, to talk about these? How about we, we get a, a volunteer to, to talk about this? Uh, Lucas, can you hear me, Ote? Lucas Matthias? 
Oh, it's actually Gwen. I'm using someone else's computer because mine wasn't working and I can't oh, change the name. Great. So, uh, Gwen, can you talk about this portrait of an Arab woman? How I mean, do you feel about this? How would you analyze this? How would you describe this? Um, I mean, I guess it's uh, an example of beauty standards, I would assume, of that culture, perhaps. I mean, I don't really know nothing about that culture, but I think she looks pretty, so I guess it's a beauty standard. Okay, keep going. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm trying to get at. Is that normal for you? I mean, why or why not? Is this it... is not normal for me because we don't, I mean, it, traditionally in America, we don't really dress like that. I mean, we don't have to like, I mean, of course there are, there are <laughs> yeah, getting, people in America. It's getting hard to old... describe this. Okay, keep, keep going. Any other comments? Um, if we assume that you're doing this for educational purposes, what could somebody else from the United States in our group say about that picture? Maybe it's not you, Gwen, but somebody else from America. Donald Trump. What would oh, he okay. say about um, this picture? Well, people who want to judge her be like, well, why would she dress like that? Like, I'm sure, wouldn't it get hot in the summertime or whatever? Like, take off some layers you know what i mean <laughs> okay is there anybody that is uh muslim in our group um that's me i'm um, coming from this same culture i would say this is a uh, normal and this is like a religious requirement for um women in our religion but that's not like um you know mandatory because there's a freedom of um, religion in my country so a lot of people a lot of women who want to have this kind of you know like um, layers they can do it but um, it's not like mandatory so I, I would say this is normal in my country okay can you explain perhaps why somebody would choose to do this um, why I would say if if if, if a woman is like religious like strong religious, um, they would choose it because that's what the um, religion says. You know, like women are, they require to cover up their um, body parts, only the eyes and like the hands should be visible to others. Okay, so in some ways you were saying um, like the Donald Trump environment in the United States, some people go to church. That's their normal. Why do they go to this one place, you know, regularly? Why do they do that sort of action? It's the same thing as this. Those people are doing a certain action or activity. It's the same as these people doing those things. Or it, maybe the Donald Trump, he wears maybe a, a necklace with a cross on it. Why do they wear this metal around their neck? It, it could be considered similar to this. Okay, is there any other explanation? Would you like to provide more information about why somebody, why a girl would want to cover her body all except her hands or eyes? Um, I guess the main reason would be um, love for the religion. Sure, the, <laughs> that whole concept, most of the world has more than 50% divorce rates. You get together, you get in a relationship, you get married, and then there's some, usually there's a lot of people having affairs, going uh, out and, and uh, ultimately having an affair resulting in possible divorce. This type of uh, thought is talking about you're preventing those type of bad things. You're, you're saving yourself just for the one person you love. So it's the same idea like right now. I don't know if you can see, why am I wearing a dangerous metal band on my finger? I used to work with medicine for a long time, and I know for a fact that your human body, most often when there's a serious uh, injury, it's because you're walking somewhere and your ring gets caught on something and it could break your finger off. So this metal band has resulted in hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people having their, in their finger amputated. So why do we do it? It's the same thing. It's part of just a way to show respect to somebody. 
a lot of people may think it's it's different. What about the idea of somebody in class said that will make them hot? Why do they do it? That's crazy. Well, what do they do in the hot countries? What does somebody that lives in the desert usually look like? <laughs> Don't they protect themselves in the same way? Protecting themselves from the heat, protecting themselves from the sun? So they're, they're, the more we think about it, the easier it is to understand these ideas. Please be aware of that. Um, to alleviate cultural shock, try to see the environment from the perspective of the host nationals. Replace the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, no, that's kind of ignorant. The platinum rule is do unto others as they would have done unto them. So who cares what you like? Who cares what you think? Who cares what you think is good or bad? The only thing that's important to the other people is what they think. Try to invest your time and energy to understand what do those other people think, want, feel, uh, etc. So uh, aspects of culture shock, there's cultural stress. Obviously, you should be aware of many aspects of that. There's social alienation, where you cultivate friendships with people from the home culture and the, the host culture. It includes host nationals and social events. That's the social alienation. When you go out surrounded by other people, but you still don't feel like you belong. You feel like an alien even though you're in social settings. And then we get into the social class and poverty wealth extremes. Mentors and host culture can be helpful in advising US people regarding acceptable ways of dealing with poverty wealth extremes. But remember that this idea of being rich as good is not always correct. If you guys remember in the first week when I was talking about how the CEO of the Hilton Hotels, for example, when he goes to Tahiti and he's building a new hotel with 500 rooms, he asks the artist to make one and he says that one statue is worth $100. And then the CEO of 500 room hotel says, okay, give me 500 of them for half price each. And the guy says, no way, it's triple the price. It's because of a difference in value. Uh, some people think capitalistic is, is, is king, money is king. Other people think other values, like the artist think it's good to create something new better than just having money. And then there's the financial information. There should be uh, financial information should be provided before going to a culture. Also financial counseling before uh, re-entry. Uh, I want you guys to understand the, the book is, is not exactly clear the best way for you guys to uh, deal with it um, and understand when you're going to a different culture is to try to learn about it in advance. Try integrating yourself into different groups before you go. For example, if I come from Canada and I want to come to Korea, and if I have a family of even uh, seven different kids, plus my wife and I, and we want to come from Toronto, Canada to Korea, how could we prepare for this? Any suggestions? Try to learn about the Korean culture in advance. Try to have your family join, for example, different Korean groups first. If you can join Korean groups in your home country, Perfect. Awesome. If not, you can join Korean Facebook groups or social media groups or follow K-pop groups to try to start understanding the details before you come. Start understanding some of the cultural details so you have less culture shock and you're more receptive when you arrive. Try to start learning some of the language. Those things will, will help in advance. Um, there's public and private self. So one thing called the Johari window is there's the things uh, I know or the things that I don't know. And then there's the, um, the others that you don't know. There's a, a, a square here where you understand some things and then you may have blind spots or have some things hidden that you don't notice. And then there's just a whole bunch that you don't know. Make sure that you understand 
your arena, what you're aware of, is ethnocentric. And there absolutely will be blind spots, hidden areas, and things that you don't know. And expect them. Start looking for them. That is one of the best ways to prepare for cultural shock. So this public self may include information about the person's work, family interests. The public self is small for the Japanese, but it's large for US persons, that public self. Um, what we mean by that is the when you are working in the United States, you're allowed to share just the minimum information just to get the job done. But in Japan, they're saying that almost everything is shared. That's in some ways what they're talking about. The private self may include feelings, personal information, and opinions. The private self is large for the Japanese and small for the US persons. Um, there are some videos, but we're not going to have too much time to, to talk about this. I encourage you guys to go through them and look at these details. We've also started to uh, talk about know your own culture. Go through that mind map. Go through the uh, more professional human metrics map. Um, that's most of what we're talking about today, but I wanted to point out a lot of additional information, which is very valuable. So there's five progressive stages for this Asian shock. Frustration, willing willingness to understand, ethnocentricity is the beginning, then racism, very bad, and avoidance of the culture. Those are bad things. How to alleviate this culture shock by careful selection of overseas personnel. Check who you're going to work with. Learn about the people you're going to work with. Be sensitive to these other people. Um, be aware of how you're going to react to these new situations. If you see somebody in a hijab, what is going to be your first response? Uh, are you prepared to do it? Are you prepared to interact with the person that may have that long neck, uh, uh, necklaces in Thailand. So make sure that uh, you're thinking about the reaction to criticisms. Um, be patient and be resilient to those things. Training. What's the training that we need to look at? Um, obviously, you, you need to have serious training when you're really trying to understand and communicate with a different culture. If you want to do cross-cultural communication before you start doing it, start intellectual and or real classroom training about it and then have an area training or a simulate uh, or role playing and then have your self-awareness check what is it that you usually do what are some of the words you say you think saying i care or canadians care about this well that kind of means every other culture doesn't care so be aware of those details um Cultural awareness models, understand that, the interaction approach. We're going to talk about these things more in our uh, next class, in the makeup class. Uh, I just wanted to point out that there's a variety of things. There's feedback, rewards, developing employees, uh, how to work with it, uh, relationships. But um, don't forget, some of the biggest reasons for cross-cultural communication failures when you go to a different country to work for a company like Google, Google works in many countries. If you become a Google executive, they pay you lots of money to go to a different country to work. One of the biggest reasons why you would quit that job and go back to your home country is because of your family. Your family is not prepared or your family is just left alone. If you leave your family without preparing them, that will destroy the family. And so, you know, be aware of this stuff. We can talk about this more in the uh, next makeup class. Next makeup class, we'll be emailing you contact details. Uh, it is optional, but um, of course, overall, we're going to be catching up on this stuff, um, going through the rest of um, chapter uh, four information. Any questions now that we've finished for today? Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, since I wasn't able to make my microphone work uh, at the beginning of the class, uh, you said uh, who was uh, wanted to, uh, to be in face-to-face -face class uh, in, uh, in person, you know? Uh, okay. And 
I personally would like uh, that to happen. Uh, I don't know if you uh, you, have, you will be able to do it because of coronavirus, but uh, if we can, uh, I'm, I'm totally okay uh, with doing that. Thank you for those comments. Uh, as I have been informed, because the coronavirus is still a, a big issue and not everyone, not, not even half of the students have been vaccinated yet, um, I was told that uh, online is still the, the best. Later, if uh, things get better, we can. Um, if you wanted to uh, meet with me or talk with me, um, my contacts and the teaching team's contacts is available anytime. I hope coronavirus will disappear and we can have uh, the regular class as soon as possible. Thanks for that comment. Anything else that I can address or, or talk about? Lucas or Matthias or, or Gwen, uh, whatever your name may be today, uh, I see you kind of nodding your head. And Zarnagar, I see you kind of nodding your head. Is there any other comments that you guys had before we finish class today? Uh, I don't have any.